Hello and welcome to this webinar organised by CESDA. Uh, our topic today is data on political behaviour. I am Jen Buckley and I work for the UK Data Service and I'll be joined by Hannah Schwarz, a data processing specialist with a comparative study of electoral systems. Um, she's based in Cologne at the Gaysis Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences. We also have Alexia Katsunitu, who is Director of the Data Archive at GASIS, and also an active researcher specialising in political behaviour and with an interest in European politics. Okay, so here is the overview of the webinar. Um, I'll start with a short background to CESDA and Social Science Data Services, and then I'll give a broad overview of the types of data available and how to find and access the different data resources. I will then pass you over to Hannah, who will guide us through the content and structure of data from the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems. Then we have Alexia, who will give us the researcher perspective, looking at how we can and also might continue to address questions about citizen representation. There will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, you can ask questions um, by typing them into uh, the question box on your webinar panel. This box is normally on the right of the screen. Um, if you can't see it, you, you may need to maximize the box by clicking on a red box with an arrow. You can type questions at any point, but we will pick them all up at the end. Um, so we've got an exciting program. There'll be a lot of information, but we will provide a copy of the slides after the webinar. Um, we've also um, put together to uh, information sheets containing details about the data resources we mentioned. Therefore, don't worry too much about catching all the details. Um, we will also add a recording of the webinar to the CESDA website. So CESDA. Um, CESDA is a consortium of European social science data archives, and it aims to provide a research infrastructure to enable the research community to conduct high quality research. Key tasks underlying this vision include developing standards and best practices around the management and archiving of social science data and facilitating researcher access to important resources. The core operational bodies in CESTA are national data services. National data services provide access to extensive collections of data useful for social and economic research. You may be familiar with the service in your country or some of the larger data services such as GASIS or the UK Data Service. There are many de national data services in Europe. So this image is from the CESDA website where you can find information and links to all the national data services in Europe. So fortunately, there is an array of social and economic data useful for research and political behaviour. However, the upshot of this availability is that we have a somewhat complicated data landscape with data located in many different places and available through different ways. Um, however, most of the individual elements, as we hope sure, are not too sort of challenging to navigate. Um, election studies are one of the richest sources of data available. So many countries have well-established academically directed election studies, with, for example, those in the Scandinavian countries, Britain, Germany, and the Netherlands, all going back to at least the early 1970s. And they're largely designed for testing competing theories about electoral behaviour, such as who won and why. So typically the core part of these studies is a cross-sectional survey carried out a few months after the election. Um, and this survey is usually based on probability samples and includes varied questions about the election, vote choice, um, as well as political orientations and attitudes. Many national election studies also include other elements. So, for example, some studies include a panel element, collecting information from the same individuals in waves, either across the election period and or across different elections. There are also a number of completed and ongoing projects producing comparative election data, most notably the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems, which Hannah will discuss. And Here's a, an example. So this is the British election study, um, and I've chosen this partly because we have an election tomorrow, and also because it's one of the longest running in Europe. So the webpage shows that for the 2015 um, election, there's cross-sectional data, information collected during the election campaign, an internet panel, and expert surveying data collected from Twitter, and many of this also goes on to cover the recent EU referendum. 
So data from election studies is sometimes distributed via a dedicated websites such as this one um, and or through national data services. Though access points can also vary across elections, often because the organising team or institution changes. And the guide that we've put together will include some names and links for individual countries. So social surveys are one of the, the major sources of data on political behaviour. And European countries have featured in many of the seminal surveys of political behaviour, such as Almond and Berber's Civic Culture Study, or the Political Action Study by Barnes and Cass, and more recently the Citizenship Involvement in Democracy Study. And you can access data from all of these studies um, still through the GACES data archive. A source of more recent data can be found in the major cross-national surveys, such as the European Social Survey and the International Social Survey Programme. So these both have questions about electoral participation and party affiliation in their core questionnaire, um, with further questions uh, found in the thematic modules. There's also the long-standing Eurobarometer series and the European Values Study. So access to some of the cross-national studies um, can be through infrastructures and websites dedicated to distributing the data, such as this one for the European Social Survey. Um, these portals are a very useful resource of information about the survey content and variables alongside information about some of the substantive findings and some methodological discussions. Um, but access to some cross-national studies is via one of the national data services. So, for example, the uh, International Social Survey Programme data is um, distributed by GASIS, um, who also offer some useful web pages for exploring the survey content. So in total, um, data services provide access to many thousands of data collections, including data from major academic projects, government and uh, outputs from smaller research projects. So some particularly relevant examples include the many general social surveys that occur in Europe, such as the British Social Attitude Survey and the German Albus. These surveys tend to include a few questions on political behaviour in their core questionnaire, and then more in their less regular survey modules. There are a number of longitudinal studies in Europe, um, which include some questions about political participation and attitudes. So this includes some household panel studies, such as the German Socioeconomic Panel and the Swiss Household Panel. And the UK Data Service also provides access to a number of uh, cohort studies. Um, also, although less common than quantitative data, several European national data services give access to qualitative data, such as in-depth interview transcripts, field notes, and answers to open-ended questions. So all the national data services have websites with online catalogues for searching or browsing. The example on the screen is the catalogue from Dans in the Netherlands. Um, these catalogues allow you to search using terms such as political behaviour um, or to search for particular studies. Um, as you can see here, um, you can find information and links to the major national data services in Europe on the CESDA website. Also, um, an important announcement to make is that um, CESDA are in the process of developing uh, a new catalogue, which is due to go into service in 2018. And when operational, you'll be able to search across all um, CESDA service providers. The final source of data to highlight is that there are a range of data resources relating to context and outcomes of political behaviour. So, for instance, the supply side of politics, there are data sets from expert surveys on the positioning of political parties and data sets with coding from political party manifestos. Um, for political outcomes and policy, there are data sets containing information about parliament and government composition policy agendas and social expenditure. Again, these resources are all available from different sources and the guide we've put together includes some information for these key examples. When it comes to accessing data, you'll, you'll find that some of the arrangements differ between the different sources, but usually you should be able to download it from the respective website, though often you will need to register. And when doing so, you will usually be agreeing to some terms and conditions. Um, common terms and conditions include things like trying not to identify individuals and not distributing data to others. 
Um, restrictions about the use of data are also common, so most typically that data might be for non-commercial use only or for use in research or teaching only. And a final point, in when using existing data, um, it's good practice to cite the data. So a data citation gives credit to the data creators and it also allows other researchers to find the data. In general, um, a citation should include enough information to locate the exact version of the data. Um, and you may find as well um, a recommended citation is given by the data provider. So at this point, I'm going to pass you over to Hannah um, to discuss the comparative study of electoral systems. Thank you, Jen, and uh, welcome to the part of the presentation that will be about the comparative study of electoral systems and the exciting possibilities that we see in it for cross-national electoral research. Uh, first of all, let me give you an overview of the project. So the CSCS is a decentralized and collaborative project. It's a network of independent post-election studies of different countries across the world. Our collaborators in these countries all agreed to implement uh, the CSES question battery into their own election studies, which is a 10 to 15 minute questionnaire. And the data are then deposited with us, the Secretariat, and we merge them into a single data set along with demographic, district level and macro level variables. The researchers on our planning committee devise a new theme and a new questionnaire every five years, and I will introduce you into these different modules um, shortly. The rationale for the CSES when it was founded in 1994 was to connect national election studies to make electoral research more global or um, more specifically to enable cross-national comparative research. As there is a wide variation across countries and context factors such as electoral rules, uh, systems of governance or lines of political conflict, uh, we can study how these variations impact individual attitudes and behaviors and in this case especially voting behavior and turnout. And this is the main research objective of the CSES. And we enable this kind of research by not only making available the themed module variables, so the individual level survey variables, but also um, context variables containing information about the context in which individuals are nested. Uh, namely, data is available on two further levels, on the electoral district level and on the country level. And I will go into more detail as to what these levels of data contain in a minute. For now, I want to stress that this multi-level data structure allows researchers to conduct uh, cross-national analysis as well as cross-level analysis. Let's look at the individual level data in more detail. These are our modules. Um, there are certain questions which are common to all CSES modules and they can thus also be used for longitudinal analysis. These variables are uh, respondents turnout in the current as well as in the past elections, respondents vote choice, their satisfaction with democracy, um, their sentiment of political efficacy, whether and how attached respondents feel to a party, respondents evaluation of parties on like-dislike scale, as well as their ratings of parties on a left-right scale. And furthermore, uh, a number of demographics have been consistently asked across modules, among them uh, age, gender and education. Please note that a comprehensive overview of all of our variables uh, across all CSES modules is provided on our website and you will find a link that takes you directly to a table uh, containing this at the end of this presentation. So our first module was in the field between 96 and 2001. Its central theme was uh, system performance. And let me give you some examples for the kind of research questions and topics that the module was designed for. So it's set up for research on constitutional and institutional effects on demogra democratic performance. It also allows the investigation of social underpinnings of party systems and is suited also for research into attitudes towards parties, political institutions and the democratic process more broadly. Um, for module one, we finally had 39 election studies across 31 countries implemented. In the next step, let me give you some more concrete examples of variables that are contained in this module. For example, respondents were asked whether they think um, the last elections were conducted fairly. They were asked for their opinions about the legitimacy of politicians and political parties um, in questions such as, do you think politicians know what ordinary people think? Um, do political parties care what people think? And in your view, are political parties necessary? 
Moving on to the second module, this was run between 2001 and 2006 and focuses uh, specifically on accountability and representation. Uh, central research themes uh, for which the module was intended are dealing with whether elections are successful in holding governments accountable or whether they are successful as a means to represent citizens' views. Furthermore, the module is set up for research into citizen engagement and participation. And data for this module is available for a total of 41 elections across 38 countries. And let me again give you a flavor of what are the particular items in this module. For example, respondents were asked whether they were contacted by a political candidate or party during the campaign. Um, their political participation was closely assessed by asking whether they had persuaded others for a certain vote choice, whether they had participated in campaign activities themselves or participated in protests or demonstrations. Also, respondents were asked how well they generally saw voters' views to be represented in the elections. As accountability was central in this module, respondents were also asked to assess government performance on what they thought was the most important issue in these elections and also about the performance of the party that they had voted for previously. The next module um, was run between 2006 and 11 and had its focus on electoral choices. And this module gives insights into how respondents perceive the variety and quality of political choices in an election and how their satisfaction also varied with these choices. Um, it is suited for an analyzing what could be consequences of perceived limited choice. For example, this could be looked at in terms of uh, voter turnout, the emergence of new parties or threats to democracy. And in this module, uh, we had 50 election studies uh, and finally across 41 participating countries. So the perception of having electoral choices was captured by several items. For example, asking respondents whether they perceived there to be differences between parties and candidates during the campaign. Also, respondents were asked if they considered voting for other parties and candidates or whether there was maybe some parties and candidates that they would never vote for. Other items concerned respondents' perceptions of the most important issues facing the country over the last legislative period, and respondents were also asked to judge the competence of different parties um, in dealing with this exact issue that they perceived as most important. Um, the module we are currently finishing up is Module 4, which was run between 2011 and 2016. And there's one final release of data outstanding for this module, which we expect to happen in 2018. Its uh, theme is distributional politics and social protection. Against the background of the global financial crisis, respondents were asked for their views on government expenditure and on redistribution, as well as their perceived job security. And the module also captures aspirations of upward mobility, and there's a battery that particularly measures respondents' wealth. Um, there's a secondary theme to this module, which is mobilization uh, in terms of campaign contact, also um, particularly via social media and campaign participation. And so far we have 38 election studies, but we expect to add another 10 or so for the final release. Uh, some examples of particular variables for this module include attitudes to public expenditure in different areas such as education, health, welfare or defense. Also, respondents were asked uh, how they expect their standards of living to develop over the next 10 years. In terms of mobilization, in this module, respondents were asked whether they had been contacted by a party, but this time they were also asked for the means of contact. And a similar question battery was implemented for mobilization by personal contact in the sense of whether an individual um, in the respondents' close surroundings had made an attempt to mobilize them. Let me talk a bit about the geographical coverage of the CSES. So this world map illustrates the coverage of module two. Um, you can see that most of the so-called Western world is covered and additionally Russia, parts of Latin America and some Asian countries. But we are still underrepresented, uh, especially in Africa and the Middle East. However, from this year on we've had our first African country included, uh, which is Kenya. But as this webinar focuses more specifically on Europe, I want to show you this table. Um, that will also be continued in the next slide. That shows the coverage across different modules in European countries. Uh, I'm showing this to you so maybe you can already spot a country that you are interested in here. And this is the continuation of the table. Uh, I want to mention that however you can find the, this information about um, which election studies are included in the CSES across the different modules on uh, our website and the 
direct link to this will be given at the end of the presentation. Um, what you can also note in this table is, uh, and you should be aware of, is that countries are differently represented. Some participate consistently and others only punctually. Coming up is our module 5. It has already gone into the field in some countries and we expect the first advanced release of data for 2019. The theme is democracy divided, people, politicians and the politics of populism. And at the core of this module are a number of attitudinal questions, um, particularly regarding political elites and so-called outgroups, but also towards uh, representative democracy and majority rule, as well as towards direct involvement of citizens in decision making. Another theme of the module is corruption. As for some specific variables of this module, uh, we have a political interest question and a question on how widespread respondents perceive corruption to be in their country. And then there's a numerous attitudinal statements um, targeted at political elites, for example, such as most politicians do not care about the people or the people should make most, the most important decisions. Um, and then there are those looking at attitudes towards minorities, such as uh, minorities should adapt to customs and traditions of this country or whether the will of the majority should always prevail, even over the rights of minorities. So all of this so far was about the micro-level survey variables, but I also want to briefly introduce the district and macro-level data to you. Firstly, district data is available in all five modules and for most countries. What we collect here are the number of seats contested in a district, the number of candidates or party lists that are running in a district, as well as the percent vote for the top six parties and the turnout per district. Um, in module five, an additional district level variable um, is introduced, namely the size of the electorate. As for the macro level variables, they are quite numerous, but I will mention some of them to give you an idea of the kind of data that is contained. Uh, first of all, there are system level macro data, such as official national election results, voting rules, um, party characteristics such as party family, or expert judgments on the most salient factors in the election. And another type of macro level data that we offer are aggregate data from public sources, for example the population total, or other indicators, indicators such as GDP growth or the Human Development Index, which are also offered for three time points, so the election year and then two years uh, prior to that. Uh, generally, I should say that uh, should there be any macro variables that are not in the CSCS data set but you would like to use, it's rather easy to merge them onto our data. We have also recently increased our set of country identifier variables to facilitate uh, the merging with macro data from other external sources. So after I've hopefully given you some insights into the contents of the CSCS, let me provide briefly two examples that illustrate the kind of research questions and analysis that our data enable. The first paper I want to quickly present is by Karp and Banducci, and it looks at whether the election of women candidates in national legislatures uh, influences the political engagement and efficacy of women. The authors use CSCS module two and a total of 35 countries. The research design is such that the outcome variable is on the individual level. It is the political engagement and the campaign activity of women. Their main predictor variable is a macro variable, namely the percentage of women in parliament. So they conduct both cross-national comparison and uh, a multi-level analysis, which go together in these kinds of contexts because the variation at the country level is captured by the upper level of uh, the multi-level model. Uh, Karp and Banucci's results show that women are not mobilized by the fact that there are women representatives, but that the percentage of women in parliament uh, is correlated positively with um, positive evaluations of the quality of the democratic process. Another paper that's using a similar design is the following one by Vowles from 2008. And he looks at whether differences between the degree of globalization shape individuals' perceptions about whether politicians can make a difference. He uses data from modules one and two and includes a total of 72 elections uh, across 40 countries in his analysis. In terms of design, this is again um, kind of a typical CSES research, so to say, in which the effect of a macro variable, in this case uh, trade dependence and financial integration, on a micro level variable, which is here um, respondents' perception of responsible party government is assessed. And his results show that there appears to be no such link. Next, let me give you a brief note on methodology of the survey and the CSCS philosophy of data. 
So it's important to note that our survey is a decentralized project and we does, does lack the kind of control over the design and implementation of the studies um, that centralized surveys have. However, certain preconditions have to be fulfilled in order for the CSES to accept studies into its data set. In terms of sampling, these are that um, they should be national samples of all age eligible citizens and that random sampling procedures have to be used at all stages. And we ask our collaborators for detailed documentation of their sampling procedures and we also make these documents publicly available for users. Um, the requirement in terms of sample size is that no fewer than 1,000 interviews per country should be conducted. Um, the CSES philosophy of data, um, I think it's important to get an impression about that because it can help you handle the data set um, once you decided you might want to work with it. So we are of the opinion that imperfections of a study should not be hidden but rather highlighted. And this not only enhances uh, the credibility of the project but it enables uh, our users to make well-informed decisions about how to handle the data and uh, that can improve the quality of their resulting analysis. And our major aim is for our codebook to note anything that the individual election studies um, that has a possible impact on analytical outcomes. So this results in, in large codebooks, but it enables um, our users to decide how they want to use certain variables um, if they conduct a comparative research project. And let me give you an illustration of the codebook. This is what it looks like. Um, below the variable name at the top um, and the answer options, you can see this section with election study notes for the separate countries um, and years. Um, so yeah, this section I want to draw your particular attention to because here we note all possible deviations from CSES norms that we know have occurred in the single election study and that might have an impact on how you analyze uh, these data. So please uh, look at these election study notes closely before doing your analysis as they might really change the way you treat or you recode certain variables. Generally, the CSCS data philosophy is that more documentation is better so that practitioners can make decisions in the context of their particular analysis. And next to the codebook, we also provide on our website further documentation such as the original and English language questionnaire as well as a macro report that contains information about the election results and electoral institutions and a report about the sampling design uh, and data collection, so kind of methods report. Uh, our data are available free of charge and they can be downloaded from either the CSES website or via the GESIS data catalog. And the data are archived at GESIS and ICPSR and a full release uh, is published every five years, but however, um, we publish advanced releases always containing new election studies uh, on a yearly basis. And um, these last points are the important links that I pointed to your attention to before, um, leading you to a table of all election studies in the data and all variables across modules. And you can check them on the slides that will be uploaded after the webinar. Um, last but not least, I want to point out a handy tool to do some preliminary analysis that's provided by GESIS. CSES is available in the online analysis tool SACAT. Um, if you register here for free, you can look at variable descriptions, um, tabulations, but you can also already run correlations or regression analysis and directly export the results uh, from the website. So that's it from my side and I hope I could give you some useful insights. Thank you, Hannah. That was great. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Alexia now for the researcher perspective. But just a reminder that if you have any questions um, for Hannah, please type them into the questions box and then we'll pick them up at the end. Okay, so Alexia? So, um, hi from me as well. I'm just trying to get my screen working. There. Can you see uh, the new slides? Yes, that's perfect. Thank that's you. That's perfect. Thank you very much. So, um, I'm here to give you the researcher perspective. So, I suppose I am uh, pretty much uh, um, uh, in the same uh, situation as uh, our audience. I'm a researcher of political science and um, at the same time I'm wearing two hats because I'm also director of a data archive. So, I'm like uh, the best of both worlds in, in a way. So, what I'll do, I will just uh, tell you what I do in my research. 
um, and then I will uh, discuss a little bit about what uh, needs um, I have as a researcher uh, from data archives um, and from data in, in general. So I'm a political scientist focusing on political behavior just like you and I do so on a comparative perspective. So I, what I'm trying to do is uh, compare the same research question, answer to the same research question, question um, across Europe, so European Union um, of uh, 28, 29 countries depending on um, post or before Brexit um, could be um, um, my sample. So um, issues that I, my research questions can focus on public opinion for example, especially now on environmental issues, so like questions like uh, um, what brings uh, people become more environmentally friendly? Um, does, for example, the new Trump policies uh, or withdrawal from uh, from the Paris Agreement will have an effect on environmental issues, um, environmental attitudes uh, in the European Union? But um, other other topics. Um, maybe the most uh, close to my heart, let's say, is uh, the, the overarching question of political conflict in Western Europe. What do we understand uh, from poli political conflict? Here we have the concept of representation behind it, so individuals vote political parties and political parties uh, govern uh, in their turn if they are elected um, in Western Europe. So party competition is one idea and um, individual voting behavior is the second idea. Um, the specific uh, topics within this overarching um, um, topic that I focus on is Euroscepticism, which is very trendy these days, um, lack of trust, so the, the drop, the success, the um, slow drop of trust towards uh, political institutions in, in Europe, especially because of the crisis. The radicalization of individuals that have going, goes on um, also because of the crisis and of course the quality of representation. Now, all of these questions have one thing in common. In order to answer them, we need data. So what data do I use overall? I need three types of, of data. Um, we have already heard from the previous presentation in this uh, webinar that uh, there are different types of data out there and the first source is individual level data. Individual le level data are um, types of data that help us understand the behavior of individuals. Ideally they are representative samples, so they are surveys for example, um, but these days because uh, of the problematic nature of surveys we have to look elsewhere. So um, why is the nature of surveys being, becoming problematic? You have noticed maybe that um, um, the population is becoming saturated and uh, they don't answer. They don't answer um, uh, they, they choose not to pick up the phone, they are not to be found on the phone, um, or they, uh, they just uh, flat out refuse when they are asked to, to be part of, um, of, a, um, of a survey. Um, the alternatives um, that have been used so far is internet surveys, for example, that uh, we know that a little bit of uh, different quality, in some countries they are better than in others, uh, depending on internet penetration of um, 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 in, in the population, but we also have this other type of data that are more, um, they are less representative, they have, uh, um, they have a particular type of bias um, built in them. Uh, th these are the voting advice applications. You have heard maybe of them in almost all European countries, they, they have different names, um, but there are also some that are, they have the same name across Europe, um, especially for the European elections. Uh, you have heard maybe of um, EU Profiler and the EU and I and EU Vox for the last um, uh, European election and these are generally tools where individuals can go online and uh, click through a set of questions and I find themselves in a multi-dimensional policy space and find um, the proximity to specific other political parties in their area but also in other in other European countries. So these data, um, in, they have the positive thing that uh, first of all they they are not limit in uh, they are not limited in one uh, thousand participants per country, but you can have I don't know thousands. In the last European election, we had almost close to to a million for across Europe. Um, 
The second positive thing is that you can uh, track them across days because uh, you can um, you can see the individuals who logged in and, and did the uh, the survey in one particular day might be different to, to uh, the ones that did it a week later, and so you can capture, for example, um, um, campaign effects. Um, but they have also their limitations, and their limitations are, of course, not to be forgotten. They are self-selected, so they are people who are actually interested in finding out their own position. They are people normally younger, more um, comfortable with the internet, with new technologies. They are higher educated than the average population. They are male, uh, or tend to be more male than uh, anything else. And um, um, of course, they, they tend to be slightly a tad more left-wing. Um, so in the individual level data, the, pro the problems that we have is the low uh, response rate in normal surveys, and that you, you can see also in the in complete uh, failure of some of exit polls, um, of the, the predictions of correct uh, um, results of, um, of elections, that uh, things uh, we didn't expect happened. So this is a failure, a methodological failure that comes also from the non-answering, non-responding to surveys, or people actually uh, lying when they respond to surveys. And then um, in, in the positive side, that so we have new types of data collections that um, can, um, can capture some of these problems, solve some of these problems, but they create others. So in the individual level, there are some choices to be made. On the other side, the next type of data that we use are party data. Party data um, actually are there to give us two types of information, or even the three, three types of information. The first one is how big are the political parties or how important. So um, this is easy to collect. Um, it's uh, percentages uh, uh, of vote shares and, and seats in parliaments or uh, participation in governments uh, that already has been taught. Um, uh, shown in previous presentations, and it can come from databases like PALGOV and so on. Um, then we have um, the positioning of political parties. So political parties um, have specific position on or on uh, different policy dimensions, and that can, this this can be collected through either manifestos or uh, speeches coded speeches or um, even uh, expert surveys or even candidate surveys. So you have very different um, data collection mechanisms to capture this. And third is the salience question. To what extent a specific issue is salient for a specific political party? And that, until now, has come from either uh, surveys from experts, so expert surveys, or party manifestos. Um, Party data until now have been uh, tested and tested again and again and again, and uh, we know that um, the various sources give very different information, and uh, that's why one has to be very careful what to choose. But um, overall, they uh, they are accepted as uh, problems. Then let me just give you one small problem that you might um, have. Uh, for example, using candidate surveys, you know the response rate is very, very low. So you have occasionally 10 until 15 percent um, of um, response rates, and there is a slight bias of uh, people who actually did not get um, elected because they have more time after the elections. Um, the third type that is the easiest, let's say, uh, has to do with context data. And uh, context data um, um, are easier in a way because they, uh, we're in the happy position that the government does all the work for us. So for example, Eurostat uh, collects uh, interesting information about the economic activity, uh, but also the, um, the type of population, the categories of population that we have in a country. There are other institutions like the World Bank, uh, the OECD, and so on that collect uh, context data. Also, um, CSES as a survey also collects uh, context data to support uh, the, the survey collection, but there are also other surveys that do the same. Um, the most um, problematic thing about context data, if you want, is that you cannot find them all in one place. And also, sometimes we have problems with the access and the compar comparability between countries. But especially if this comes from statistical offices, um, we can't do much. It's a government decision, and as long as the European, uh, so you, the Eurostat, so the European Community actually forces harmonization, we are good. When uh, in topics that is not uh, enforced, we have a problem. Context data are important. Um, 
on country level, but also they become more and more important on a smaller scale, and these are where the problem starts. Um, smaller scales can be regions, can be electoral districts, can be also very, very small areas um, defined by georeferencing. I will get into that a bit more. And there the problem that we always have is um, that uh, electoral districts or regions even change over time and they're overlapping. Um, so it's, um, and data collections happen actually uh, with a very different um, um, district in mind. So there is no easy way of harmonizing or actually knowing that you're actually referring to the same district with all the data that you're using. Moving on, the question that I'm asking myself is what, what is the most exciting development in, uh, in the data world for our um, political behavior research? Um, as I said, one of the, the new things is georeferencing. Now, uh, with the new technologies, we are much more able to um, georeference our data, and uh, that allows us to link, so link information between, for example, individual level uh, surveys and context data. And that can happen um, through um, simply georeferencing um, while we are collecting the information on the individual, like a survey, but also uh, if we actually collect uh, data on individuals through their um, social media um, or social media activity. So this is also the new types of data, the big data, if you want, that um, come out. Um, the good thing that is happening as well is that there is a huge amount of data that um, is created by uh, individuals themselves. So we don't need to force them, go uh, after them in their houses and knock the doors and call them to actually um, capture their opinions on specific questions. But people actually want to share much more data out there. At the same time, though, these people, even though they're willing to give this data to big corporations like Facebook and Twitter and so on, they're not as willing to uh, give us this data for um, research purposes. And that is, um, that is an issue. And that brings me to uh, the last point that, um, that actually talks about the limitations and, and, and the, the kinds of data that I think are vital for us. And, and here we talk about research data. Research data are um, slightly different to data in general because they are the kind of data that are collected or can be used for research. And here we have the problem that the data that, I, that uh, we, uh, we see out there being produced are actually behind copyright walls or behind um, uh, big problems of data security. And there we have um, the, uh, the question that arises of how can we overcome these problems in order to be able to use this data properly. On the one hand, the role of the data archives becomes more important because they can bring us um, this data through uh, secure environments and, and then we as researchers can go in a secure environment either um, where the data archive is, so in, in a room or in a, in a um, virtual room and actually have access to the data. And we hope that this type of data will be more accurate because people will be actually, um, uh, because the data will be actually capturing the behavior of the people directly and not capturing the opinions of the people that actually they are giving them to us when we ask them a few months after the elections. And, and then the data will become more accurate and we will not be asking the question to ourselves, are these voters lying? Do they actually remember right what they voted? Um, do they recall the correct, uh, um, the correct questions? Uh, do they understand what we mean? Uh, no, it will be much more accurate because we will be capturing their um, the actual behavior. Um, this will also allow us to have a better uh, other type of um, context data, the media data. Um, as you know, media studies are much more uh, complicated because um, somebody has to sit down and code them for weeks on end. And um, media data can, um, through, through technology, can become much easier, be um, coded through algorithms and can be um, connected directly to other types of data, so data linking is the future. Um, and through that we can also achieve shorter embargo time. So you know, sometimes where a colleague colleague collects data and they say, okay, I collect this data and I need them at least for two years just for my own research and then uh, 
promises that he will give it to us uh, or she will give it to us but actually forget so like five years later we still don't have the data well this is not uh, it will not be the case um, once we uh, overcome this problem and have open data more um, and one last thing that we actually need is a better training because um, at least I was uh, very well trained in uh, analyzing um, for example survey data um, or like um, what we call a two-dimensional matrix data, uh, where you have your variable and your respondent. Um, and I'm not very well trained to analyze Twitter data, for example. So uh, what we need is better training that corresponds to uh, analyzing these new types of data. So we live in exciting times. Technology is on our side, even though um, a service might be facing a little bit of a problem. So I believe that uh, we are all um, in, in a situation that we can definitely access more data and analyze more interesting data than before. So uh, that's all for me. Um, I'll pass on to, uh, to Jen. Thank you. Thank you. That was really great. Um, at this point, so there's now time for questions. Um, just again, a reminder um, that to ask a question you need to type it into a box which is in your control panel and um, if you can't see the question you might need to maximize the control panel to so look for a box with a red arrow in it and um, if you have a question specifically for Hannah or Alexia or myself just um, perhaps include our name in the text so I can work out who it's for um, and also, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, there are some supporting materials for this webinar. These are now available for you in the handout part of the control panel. So you'll be able to find the slides and also two information sheets there. Um, we'll also be making the materials available on the CERTA website after the webinar. Um, so I'll just turn to the questions. So, We've got a question, first of all, for Hannah, um, and this is, does the um, CSCS have individual level data on ethnicity and or nationality? Um, yes, thanks Elena for that question. Um, we do have data on ethnicity as well as race, so those are two variables that we have been including since module one and uh, all throughout uh, to module four and now also five. Um, my experience is that not all countries provide these demographics. Uh, some do. Most of them provide only one of the two. Um, but also, as you might know, in some countries it's, it's not even uh, legal to ask for ethnicity. So, so there will be some missing countries um, as well. So I really recommend you to, to go to our SACA tool or else to the codebook or, or the data set and look whether the countries that, that you're interested in uh, have these variables. Um, there is another variable that might be of interest to you that we've included recently in, in Module 4, which is the country of birth and also the year arrived in current country for people who indicated that their country of birth was not uh, the country they reside in. So these two variables are available um, only from Module 4. That's great. Thanks, Hannah. Um, just, I just had two questions for you that are linked. I was wondering whether you could answer them. So one is whether there's, um, or how many questions are repeated across the modules, if any, um, that would sort of allow over time analysis, what sort of themes could be, could be done mm -hmm. over time? Yeah, uh, I, I've mentioned, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. All right, so, and then just the other question was about whether there was any other plans to repeat particular modules. Um, let me answer the second question first. That's easier because no uh, modules will not be repeated. What we, how we construct our modules is that um, there are always open calls to to any researcher or anybody who's interested to hand in proposals for new modules, and so uh, it does happen that certain questions, certain topics overlap, and then um, the same or similar questions will be asked. But generally, uh, every five years, a completely new module is in place. However, there are certain uh, items, not only only vote choice and turnout, which are at the core, but also uh, certain more items that uh, have been so far repeated in all modules, so that would also enable longitudinal analysis. And um, that I've mentioned on one of the slides, let me just uh, tell them again. So satisfaction with democracy is another one. Um, this is next to turnout and vote choice. Um, political efficacy, party attachment, 
um, evaluations of parties on the like-dislike scale, and ideological assessments of parties on the left-right scale, and then certain demographics. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I can. Um, I'll ask uh, Alexia a question if possible. I was wondering whether you could tell me the, the tools you mentioned, such as the EU Vox, I was wondering whether there was any examples of these kind of um, sort of uh, policy positioning data tools, where the data from that had been archived and made available for researchers at all? Yes, so basically the um, 2009 European elections, the tool was called um, um, EU Profiler, and this has been archived by GESES. Um, and um, the 2014 election tool, there were two tools actually, the one was um, 2000, uh, sorry, that was um, EU and I, that has been already um, archived again by GESES, and EU Vox um, is now in the process of being archiving, ar archived by GESES. Um, we, we're still missing the, the, the data for political parties positioning. So everything should be found um, in, in the um, in the cases archive. Um, and just is, do you have any examples of um, the sort of work that's been done using these data sources? Um, and this is a new uh, type of literature um, that is uh, called literature on the VAA, so the voting advice applications, and it has two main components. So two main components. One is the methodological one, analyzing the 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 limitations and the, the possibilities um, of, the, of the data. And the other type uh, deals with um, either party positioning, so how po political parties move and what dimensionalities they offer in the, um, uh, the European uh, space. And the, uh, uh, the other questions uh, is matching between uh, individuals and, and parties, so representation questions, quality of representation. So to what extent the party you voted for corresponds to your true uh, policy position. So are we, in other words, if you want, is are we as individuals voting according to our policy preferences or is there any other reasons that um, lead us to vote for specific parties? For example, preferring the leader or uh, wanting to avoid another political party, so tactical voting and so on. 